hello, friends and neighbors. Uh, we're a group of five writers who have been meeting for four years every week, uh, sometimes for four hours, as long as we want to talk and read our new work. Uh, we are fiction and nonfiction writers who are trying to write things that we're not comfortable with. We're experimenting. Um, the women that I'm about to introduce both have new novels, and they are extraordinary stories. Esmeralda Santiago, the author of three novels and three memoirs, including the American classic, When I Was Puerto Rican, lives in Katona, and she is the one who put this group together. She's a leader, what can I say? Esmeralda Santiago? Joey Davidow is the author of works of memoir, fiction, and nonfiction. And she and Esmeralda have collaborated on two anthologies. Joey, um, Joey lives in Italy, <laughs> so I just met her on Tuesday. Um, please welcome Joey Davidow. Now, I would like to say a few things while they're sitting here. Uh, it's not surprising that these women have written memoirs. They have led fascinating lives. And I will tell you one thing about each of them. OK, maybe two things. <laughs> and you won't believe me, maybe. Um, you can imagine all the rest. I will let them carry on and tell it. Uh, Esmeralda uh, has been a voice for the Puerto Rican diaspora and a vital literary public figure in speaking out and reminding us that, yes, Puerto Ricans are US citizens only without the vote and without full representation. But she has also been a dancer, an Indian classical dancer. OK, there's a head scratcher. <laughs> there is a dancer in her new novel, Las Madres. There is multiple evidence of other things that she is very familiar with that she has put to use in this novel, and I'm hoping she will talk about it. Joey is fascinating because she was not only the founder of In Style, of, of I'm sorry, LA, LA Style. Style Magazine, she was also an opera singer. So there's another head scratcher. And one of her novels was about a historic opera figure. Um, and it is a fascinating story. Uh, I will also say this about Joey, <laughs> that um, she can dig up extraordinary stories from the archive and turn them into terrific works of fiction. Uh, sh this story that she has dug up for her new novel is uh, a story of a woman of the Jewish ghetto of Rome who was kidnapped and held in a convent against her will. Um, let me just say also that these novels, it's extraordinary that these stories survived. It's extraordinary that these women survived to tell them. Uh, we know that there are terrible things happening in the world right now, um, and we grieve. But we also cup our hands around stories like this that might be told in a house in ruins with no electricity after a hurricane or whispered in the alley of centuries old Jewish ghettos. Please welcome my sisters, Esmeralda Santiago and Joey Davidow. Thank you, Marilyn, it's very sweet. Um, we're just so thrilled to be here. Thank you all of you for coming out to, to see us and to listen to us uh, chat. Our, our um, writers group meets every week. We, um, of course, read our work to one another, but we also learn about one another. And so we have become like sisters over the last few years. It's very interesting that I knew all these women but didn't, they didn't all know each other. And so some of them just met today in person because they've only known each other on, uh, via uh, virtual meetings. So it's very, uh, it's very emotional for me to know to have you all here and, and uh, to have you in person. 
And so, you know, when uh, Esmeralda asked me to join the writers group, I was flattered, but I was also terrified. And when we first got together and these brilliant women started to read their work, I was really literally sweating. And I thought, I can't read my crappy little thing after listening to these people are brilliant writers. And being able to share my work with people for whom I had such enormous respect, which only grew and grew over the years, has made me a better writer. And more than that, it has given me permission to feel that I can do what they're doing because they believe in me. And because they believe in me, I have the courage to write things I would never have been able to do without them. And um, this book that I just had published last week <laughs> was um, rewritten completely with the aid of the writers group. And that's the way we work together. We worked like that with Ez's book and the other writers. Um, it was finished, and I got to read one chapter every week, and I would get comments, very useful. More than that, I got encouragement to make me think maybe this will ever get published someday, and it did. And so um, I did, so far, I'm on the third book with this group. Um, two years ago, I published a book called An Unofficial Marriage, which is the story of the love affair between the great Russian author Ivan Turgenev and the most famous opera singer of her time, Pauline Viardot. And I read that chapter by chapter to the group. And then my new book, Anything But Yes, which is the story of an 18-year-old girl who was living in the Roman ghetto, which meant that uh, they were locked in from sunset to sunrise for 300 years, the Jews of Rome. And um, she was uh, abducted at gunpoint and thrown into a convent that was especially to try to force baptisms. And it's her struggle to get out. But once again, the group was there to help me write through the, through the final rewrite and now for the first time I'm writing a book from scratch with them, which I would never even have started if it wasn't for this group. So I'm very grateful to Esmeralda for having invited me to join the group and for the years and years and years before the group when she read everything I wrote and I read everything she wrote and it's just been a wonderful relationship. Thank you, it's really, uh, it's really amazing because when you get to know somebody, you, can, you feel free to then say things that you might not say to a stranger. So yeah. I think it, this group gelled together very quickly. And um, at the time that we, that we started, I had already written two books, two of which, both two novels that are in drawers. They're, they, for different reasons that I won't even go into right now, um, they're, they just didn't work the way they should. And, um, and when I began writing Las Madres, uh, was really when we first started talking, actually, and it really came from from our discussions and and my um, my feelings about what had been happening in Puerto Rico, not only during the hurricane um, Maria in 2017, but the aftermath and the fact that um, for us in the United States. Um, so many other things have happened since then. And so Puerto Rico is not in the news because there are other things happening in, in the, the world, world that, that people need to know about. But uh, in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria is still happening. And there are people who are still without electricity, without running water, uh, people who have not been able to uh, repair their homes because, of course, FEMA required a lot of paper that they couldn't get because it had been taken away by the flood. So, so I, I, I approach this, um, the, the writers group with this idea that I, I wanted to write about Hurricane Maria, but I didn't really know. I, you know, you just, I'm gonna write about a hurricane. Uh, there's a lot that can be said. I was living in the United States in my cozy warm house as this was happening. I was very uh, nervous and upset and curious about what was happening there. Um, very emotional um, when I realized that I knew more about what was happening in Puerto Rico than the people who were living through that terrible experience. So all these things were kind of roiling and, and um, just 
circling me uh, in <laughs> day and night. And, um, and so I, um, I began by, by trying to create characters who um, in some way would be affected by the hurricane. And it really was, unlike a lot of my other books, I'm, I'm one of these um, organized <laughs> people. <laughs> and so this one was a very different process because I, I became, I, I started with the idea that there would be a hurricane, right? Something was gonna happen in the middle, that was gonna be a hurricane. And at the end, people who are in the hurricane are gonna still be alive, and then there's gonna be a lot of people who are not gonna be alive. That's pretty much it. Um, and so my, it became a thing that every week that um, I would go to um, to writer's group, I would write, read a, a new chapter or part of a chapter as I was trying to create these people. It's about five women. They're all related to one another through friendship or by blood ties. And they came to me one at a time. Um, they came from the research that I did about what happened in Puerto Rico and, and what people had to do in order to survive. And, um, and the, uh, the process was one of uh, discovering it for myself and then hearing their response to my discoveries. Uh, and most of them made it into the book and some of them didn't, but that's, that's part of, of being in this kind of group is to be able to, to try things feeling as if you're not going to be judged. Somebody, nobody's gonna say this is terrible, throw it away. People help you process it. And so um, Luz, Graciela, Marisol, Shirley, and Ada emerge from the research that I, that I did, but also a lot of it came from these broken scenes that I kept bringing that they either said, oh, yeah, they would ask questions, basically. That's what we do for one another. We ask questions, and then if we have a question for them, they're very open and, and, and uh, wonderful about um, being able to being honest with their opinion, which is the most helpful. Um, so the, the five women decide that they're going to Puerto Rico for the birthday of the eldest of the uh, five women, but of course they don't know when they leave uh, JFK that five days later this hurricane would devastate the island and that they, they would be stranded there and that their relationships would be tested not only by what happens during the time of the hurricane, but a lot of secrets emerge because when you are under great emotional stress, these kinds of things tend to happen. And, um, and so, so they, the, 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 the hardest thing of that book for me was actually writing the scene of the hurricane itself because it's very, of course, you know, I was a little kid, I, I, I experienced a hurricane, but as a little kid, it was fun. Um, you know, <laughs> all the families and the, the neighbors, everybody gets together in a warm house and they, the ladies are cooking and the men are telling stories and the young people are, you know, and so I remember this hurricane as being kind of, oh, that was so cool. You know, we got the whole community was together and then come outside and everything is gone that you know. Uh, and so then I had to call upon that memory in addition to a lot of the, the research. And I remember that when I read that chapter to, to the group, I couldn't get through it. I was sobbing through it because it was, it was very, very personal for me. And I think of all the books that I've written, even though I have written three memoirs, Las Madres is probably the most personal um, because not only um, the emotions that, that, that I had to express <laughs> that I try to keep very much at bay, um, but, but also um, I realized how much I love my people, how much, what they mean to me. And that was, um, I think if, I, if nothing else happens with this book, that has been the gift to me, is to have been able to, to write it and then to now share it with you and hopefully um, you will you will like it and and um, and you will learn from from these experiences. You know, uh, as and I have something in common, which is that her book is something that she 
is giving to her people, it's her people's story. And my book, because I'm Jewish, is the same thing. Um, I'm telling a story that people don't know, which is what happened to the Jews of Italy, what happened in the Roman ghetto. And I didn't know that. And I lived in, I've lived in Italy for 23 years. And it was when I began to work on this book that I learned this really terrible story, because I did not imagine that there was any kind of anti-Semitism in Italy, or my beloved second home. So what happened is I was looking for my next historical novel. And it's very important when you find a subject for a book as a writer that you have a huge passion for it, because you're now going to commit hundreds and hundreds of hours of your life to this story. And you better have, it's like getting married, so you better really be in love. And my process as a writer is so much the same as my process was as a singer, which is I have to become my protagonist. I am that person. I feel what she feels. I, I cry when she cries. And I'm in love with all the other characters because those are also my people. So what happened was I found a diary that was written in 1749 by a girl named Anna Del Monte when she was 18 years old. And she was thrown into this convent, which was called the House of Converts, the Casa de Catacumene, and, she, and they locked her in. And uh, she was subjected to brainwashing, really, and sleep deprivation and all those things until they would get her to um, say, OK, I give up. So. When I got to Italy, I wondered, because I knew, I learned quickly that um, the Jews of uh, Rome and all the papal states had been forced to sell whatever property they owned, whatever homes they owned, and move into this least desirable part of the city because it was where the Tiber flooded, and rent, and that there was not enough room for all of them, and that uh, things got progressively worse as they were taxed worse and worse taxes until they couldn't survive. And that none of the succeeding popes ever let them out for 300 years. They did not get out until um, the reunification of the peninsula with Garibaldi when Italy became its own country. And I thought, why didn't they just convert? What was so terrible? And then I found out that if you converted, you could never see another Jewish person again for the rest of your life. Well, that would include your mother and father, your husband. And uh, that the popes were really very upset about the fact that in their very shadow lived all these people who didn't believe in their religion. And it was very important for them that Catholicism was the only religion in Europe. It was the religion. So they would find ways to um, find excuses to try to convert people. You could be um, denounced. You, somebody who doesn't like you, let's say your daughter-in-law, could say, oh, I heard my mother-in-law say that she only wishes she was Catholic. And they would come and get her and arrest her and put her into this house. And you know, sooner or later, she would give in because it would make it so hard. So what I loved about this 18-year-old girl was that she had the courage and the faith to stand up to these men who were the most powerful men in the church because they kept bringing higher and higher levels of clergy in to try to talk her into it. But she was educated. Um, she was uh, from a, a family that had a little bit more than the rest because her parents had been, her family had been bankers before they took away the banking licenses. And she was given an education and she quoted Plato to these clergymen and she would explain to them why they didn't understand the Bible. So in order to write this story, I had to get out of that convent. In the beginning, I just tried to write the story from, based entirely on, the, on my translation of her diary. And then um, that didn't work. And I was writing in the first person, and everybody felt claustrophobic. And Esmeralda said, why don't you try it in the third person? So, so I wrote it again in the third person, and I started to say, what's going on in the ghetto? So I had to learn more and more and more about the ghetto culture. And although it was a place of terrible deprivation and poverty and crowding and all of those things, it was also a safe place. And so they would call it my little haven because they were um, secure. They were locked in at night, they were, and they were locked in until dawn, and the thugs and anti-Semites and whoever might have tormented them 
couldn't get into the ghetto. They were safe. When cholera broke out or some other disease broke out in Rome, the Jews didn't get it because they were locked in. Um, and so there was a culture in the ghetto. There was a music in the ghetto. There were traditions in the ghetto. There was a language in the ghetto, which I had to learn um, a lot about, which was sort of an Italian version of uh, Eastern European Yiddish. It was a combination of Italian and Hebrew. And that made this a different book for me and a much more important story because nobody knows. Nobody knows what went on in there. And especially now with what's going on in Israel, it's, it's so poignant to me. Um, at one point, my um, protagonist brother was one of the governors of the ghetto. They were a very prominent family and so a tremendous prize for the church if they could get her to convert. Uh, he wrote to um, the head of the English Jewish community and asked if the if Roman Jews could emigrate en masse to England because they couldn't survive in Rome anymore. And the English said, we'd love to have you, but we just got this huge influx of people from Holland. We don't know what we would do with you. And there was no Israel. There was no place for them to go. So in these terrible days of what's going on both in Israel and in Gaza, it's horrible. Um, I couldn't help but think about that. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's really interesting that even though we're working, all five of us are working on really different, um, different kinds of books. And uh, I think that we should talk a little bit because I think I would like you to meet the other members of our group. Absolutely. And I have, I have to read it, Judith, because I, I, uh, it has been many years since I've had to uh, memorize anything. I want to make sure that I said the right thing <laughs> so it's written down. Uh, I'd like to introduce our writing partner, Judith Dupre, who has written many books about architecture, including the first history of the new World Trade Center. Thanks to our recruitment, she's working in a new genre. She'll tell you a little bit about it. Her historical novel set in 1885 centers on the showman P.T. Barnum and the psychologist William James, who joined forces to solve a murder at the greatest show on earth in 1885. Take it away, Judith. <laughs> It's so exciting to hear your comments about the books because they obviously deserve all the admiration and credit, but we're like the midwives. We're the very <laughs> proud midwives of these books. Um, and I hope that people will ask questions because there's so much more to say about both books. And, you know, both books deal in, in a very literal way with Esmeralda's book with the eye of the storm, where the five women are in this pocket of quiet at one moment. And then with Joey's book, there is this political stillness that's holding um, Ana Del Monte. Um, I would like to introduce two more, two more of the midwives, very proudly. Why is this mic like right in my face? Okay, um, Kathy Medwick and Marilyn Johnson. Kathy, <laughs> Frank, am I on the camera? <laughs> I'm supposed to be on. So you're on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I drove four hours to be here today. <laughs> Frank, get me on. Get me on tape, please. Um, all right. Kathy Medwick, her widely praised biography of St. Teresa of Avila introduced a major new figure to women's studies groups, um, curr curricula at Wellesley and many other colleges. She's now working on a book about an influential but lesser known 16th century poet and mystic, St. John of the Cross. Teresa of Avila was John of the Cross's mentor until he became hers. Two very different people, two very different saints, two, uh, the worldly and the spiritual, they encompass both. Um, 
Kathy's book started as a straightforward biography, but thanks to the writing group, <laughs> is now a hybrid of biography and fiction. They really do work on those books, um, what, what everyone is working on. Um, Marilyn Johnson told me that I had no need, to, I did not have to introduce her because apparently her reputation precedes her. But I will say, <laughs> I will say that Marilyn has written a string of well-researched, eloquently written, and wildly entertaining books that highlight specific professions. Um, the Deadbeat, about obituary writers. This book is overdue, about librarians. And Lives in Ruins, about archaeolog archaeologists. Marilyn has returned bravely to her roots in poetry and is finishing an emotionally resonant, stunning book of poetry. And Marilyn, you know, Marilyn is a woman of few words, which is why she's returned to poetry, I guess. Um, <laughs> but when she, when she addresses the issue at hand with any, any given manuscript, it means everything. So I want to tell you a little bit, a little bit more about the writing group. Um, as you know, we've known each other for years. And we have written together in different um, iterations. In some cases, like Esmeralda and Joey, they've known each other for decades. Um, the current configuration began meeting um, on February 12th, 2020, via Zoom. Um, and I just want, I brought one of the treasures. This is the notebook from the first year. And it really is. And, it's full, and now there are other notebooks. But um, I would keep notes. And it really is this extraordinary record of like um, all the the growing and the changing that we've gone through. You know, I'm a, a, a well-seasoned nonfictionist, and suddenly <gasps> I'm writing fiction. So it's some, some amazing insights in this book. Um, and I'll share a couple. And you, you all will, I'm sure, recognize where these book, where, the, where these comments come from. Don't make it pretty. Make it move! Exclamation point. Do people eat chocolate muffins in springtime? <laughs> Wouldn't they eat fruit muffins? Eternal damnation is a clear and present danger. <laughs> Let me guess. Everyone is uglier and more beautiful than they think they are. And that took me a nanosecond to call from this amazing book, as we're all, we're, we're, we're trying to find out how we fit together and how our books, you know, how our books are coming together. There's been just an extraordinary evolution. Um, even for those seasoned novelists, there's been so much change. Um, we've met every week on Thursdays. Um, we're, Going up to our fourth anniversary, even my 93-year-old mother, who's fond of calling every, all of her kids at least three, four, or five times a day, even she knows she is not to call me on Thursdays until after 2 o'clock. Um, you know, working, we've worked together, come hell, high water, and COVID, and everyone shows up, even when we don't feel like it. We show up for each other, and we show up for the writing. The sessions are intense, three to four hours long, with bathroom breaks. Um, and we listen to and comment on the pieces that each person has prepared. And you know, naturally, we're humans. We all love encouragement. We all love to hear good things about our work. And, and the group is quick to point out the things that work. But really, what we're looking for is constructive criticism. Is the language lumpy? Does the dialogue sound authentic? Are our characters behaving in believable ways? What does the reader need to know? What does the reader need to feel? What can be eliminated? And these comments draw on more than 300 years 
total life experience. <laughs> That's incredible. I'm only 39, so I don't know exactly how this math works, but there you go. Um, this mutual act of witnessing and receiving takes immense generosity and trust. And I know my own book would not ever have been possible, never in this form, never, it's morphed so much thanks to this incredible group of women. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without um, the accountability of the group and the love that we have for each other and for the written word. And I am, to all four of you, I am absolutely in your debt. Now, I would like to ask some of the other writers some questions. So, Kathy, do you want to tell tell the room how the writing group has influenced your own your own book? Would you like to come up? Yeah. Great. So, um, hi. Um, I am the village introvert. Um, I, it's perfectly okay, Frank, if you don't want me on camera, I, I don't have to be on camera. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm here because I'm, I am sort of the last person on earth who would ever be in a writing group. I like to be alone. I'm solitary. Somehow, Esmeralda, my neighbor and friend, um, who I had also worked with when, when I was an editor and she was this wonderful writer, um, st started taking walks with me. And she said, you know, I have this writing group. Um, you know, maybe you'd like to be involved. No, no, <laughs> no, please. So, so then she sort of said, um, you know, there's somebody I'd like you to meet. Her name is Judith Dupre. She's interested in a lot of the stuff you're interested in. She's written books about church, the Virgin Mary. Why don't you, we'll all have tea at your, so we all had tea. And then she said, you know, maybe the three of us could get together just really informally, have a meal, um, and, and, you know, you don't have to write anything for it, but you just see. That's how I started doing this. That's how she seduced me into doing this. And, you know, what I was writing was totally different from what I'm doing now. It was very historical, it was very straightforward. But I got all this encouragement from the two of them. To this day, I have no idea how I ended up in an online writing group. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how. But there it is. It's been going on for more than three years. Um, this book has come, transformed and has transformed me as I'm now writing, I don't know, more from the heart or something. And I'm just so you know grateful, and also I tend to have writer's block, which I'm sure some people here who write also have. Um, they are everybody in this group. They don't make they don't shame me when I don't come with anything, and there are lots and lots of weeks when I don't come with anything. But I'm you know they say well no it doesn't matter because you have something to say and we want to hear what you have to say. So for me it's been wonderful. It's been social, it's been intellectual, it's been kind of spiritual, I have to say. So thanks to all, I, sooner or later I will produce a book. The last one only <laughs> took me 15 years, so you know, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Judith, back to you. Or, uh, <laughs> I don't know if there are any other writers in this room or people who are thinking about writing, but I would like to say something else about what Writers Group does, at least what it does for me. I don't have I don't have writer's block, but I needed an excuse to have something written every week. And knowing that on Thursday, these girls are going to say, do you have something to read? I'm going to have something to read. I'm going to write, which I'm, I might say, I don't, I'm too busy. I work as a freelance book editor. I don't have time for my own work. If it wasn't for the writing group, would I have finished the two books that I published since we got together? I don't know. Maybe not. You don't want to be the one who goes, well, you know, I don't really write anymore and blah, blah. I don't have time. You want to show up and be part of the group because you want to keep up with these are great writers you got in this group and you want to keep up. It becomes not competitive, but it's a challenge to be with people of that caliber who are, are such good writers. And it makes you a better writer because you want to show them that you can write too. 
And I think the, the other thing that, that we do for one another, of course, is, you know, we all deal with editors and agents and publicists and <laughs> critics and that kind of thing. And, um, and sometimes we will come to, um, to our Thursday meeting because something had happened. It had nothing to do, you write the book, you send it off, you, you know, you, you just, you suffer for it, right? And then you send it to, to your publisher and then you have, the, it's just like this whole process that really is not about us but it is about us. And so this, it gives us having this, this group also is a way to vent sometimes because we have to. Sometimes we're in situations where, um, you know, for, for the, but the way I think about it is my books are a gift to my readers. But to my publishers, I'm a product, right? Yeah. And so so th this is, you know, fine, there's people out there, you know, but for them, I am a little check in their accounting. Um, and I'm sure that if, if uh, they were here, they would say, no, no, no. We would, you know, but sometimes that's what you feel like um, in, in these processes. And I think that's one of the things that we are able to help one another because we've all had these experiences with, right. with, yeah. uh, with all these people that surround us who are not sitting in our room working on our books with us, but have their opinions, which sometimes, yeah. you know, you just don't want to pay attention to. Um, so it's, it's been very, very helpful, I think, well, for me particularly, because I, I get really hot and bothered a lot, and I write a lot of long long angry emails to people <laughs> when they don't, you know, if they don't do things the way I think they need to be done for my book, I get really upset. And so I'm able to actually vent um, about these kinds of things with someone who understands because we've all, we've been, all been through, through it. it in one way or another. We've all had these kinds of experiences. And so we learn from one another about how to deal with them. And even between meetings, we meet on Thursdays, but when my book cover came in, I didn't wait till Thursday, I sent that cover out to all of my sisters. And what do you think? You know, and I got, and I, especially Judith is, you know, a very visual um, person and very visual books that she's done. So I had somebody who could give me good advice. Um, I did the same thing just last week because I got an audition tape from the actor who was supposed to read the audio version of my book. And I'm going, no, I don't think I like this. What do they think? And it's, it's such a support system. And that, that was amazing because, uh, so in that case, uh, thanks for reminding me of this, Judith. So I get this, this email from the publicist saying, we're so excited about this, this cover design, you know? And I looked at it and I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> so I said it to them and they're all like instantly, you know, saying, no, no, whoever did this design did not read the book before they designed it, which is what we, figured out had happened because right. it had just they read i think they read the cover you know they the flap copy yeah and so that's it and so it was very it helped me then to be able to write to them and say no you know it it, it, it this is not it it does not say anything about what this book is about and you know back to the drawing board essentially and um you know, to, to have the courage to do that because these are all professionals also. You know, these people, they do this every day for thousands of books a year. And to, to have the courage to say, well, you, wrong. Wrong. <laughs> you I mean, and you are one person usually. It's just you, this writer, very insecure. You've laid your guts out on the line when you send this manuscript away. And now you're up against random house or something like that and suddenly you've got four other people on your team yeah. right. and it's so different it's such a gift yeah it's really fantastic um are there any questions from from the audience about anything we've said or anything that we have not said that you wish we'd say <laughs> so stand up and speak loudly so we can oh, hear you please Brady, could you repeat the question after we still get them? okay yeah Meaning 
tomorrow night <laughs> to talk about your book. And it, it strikes me that there are five of you in this group that sort of helped you birth the book, and that there are five women. <coughs> Whoa, you just blew my mind. <laughs> No. <laughs> the question is that uh, there are five women, five protagonists, and then there's five of us. Oh, right. <laughs> and, and um, you know, I, I had, until you said that, I had not connected that right, at all. Me uh, it's really interesting. Um, of course, <laughs> we. <laughs> None of their stories are in the in the book, but I think um, I think it, five is a great number. You know, it's just it, it, if I think if if it's four, then there's like a competition. You know, <laughs> but having an odd number is really good. But it really had not occurred to me until this moment that this fantastic group of women who has midwifed uh, this book are five women. <laughs> so thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> that we trust each other yeah um well i can speak for myself that when i heard what they wrote i trusted them i thought anybody who can write like that i want to hear what they say about my work um i it was because i respected them so much um i respected their enormous skill the things that i have to talk about with the books that i edit with the authors that i work with are never mentioned in our group we're way beyond that and so um if they think that, then that means that I trust it. And I will really think about it before I um, toss that advice aside. I write down everything. And when I go back to do the next write, I rewrite, I have the notes for my group. And I try, to, I try to work it in. And it has made my books so much better, because what they're really doing is challenging me to dig deeper, work harder, refine more. And I, for me, it was, so Joey and I have known each other since 1994, something like yeah. that. And we share our work, and we actually have collaborated on, on two, two anthologies books. of uh, Latino literature. And Marilyn and I were in a group that used to meet every week at Le Jardin du Roi for decades. <laughs> and, um, and for me, the, the, the trusting them was because they were all friends. I've known Kathy for a long time. I've known Judith for a long time. I knew them all as friends, and I knew that they were all writers. But the idea of putting them together, there was a part of me going like, they're all so different, you know? They're all so different and working on such different projects. And, and, uh, and yet, I think, you know, like, like Joey says, you know, you, you respect somebody's work and you want to, you want their opinion about your work because you know that they're very skilled, very talented, I've done it for years, and they know how to give criticism without you feeling that somebody's attacking you. <laughs> because that's the last thing that you need when you're in an artistic process. You do not, you really want the opposite of being attacked. You want somebody who lifts you up and to continue to, to explore. And yes, there are so many times, you know, that uh, something that just doesn't work, you know, and we try to, f to tell one another what is not working. It's not saying that you're a terrible writer, it's that this is not working for this reason. And then it allows us to then have an opportunity to then go forward and make it, uh, you know, make it better or make it funnier or whatever it is that that, that particular uh, scene or moment requires. You're so vulnerable when you're writing because you're sharing some very particular part of yourself. You know, um, years ago when I first started writing fiction, I had written memoir before that. Ed said, you know, when you write fiction, you have to be even more honest. And I thought, oh, you know, because you can't write a character 
from the inside without using your own insides. Where else are you going to get that information? And, you know, this is how I would feel in that situation. That's what comes out on the paper. But I know when I'm reading my very personal, now I'm writing another memoir, so this is very personal. And when I know that I'm reading it to my fans, I'm reading it to four other women who believe in me, who think I'm a good writer. And that gives me the courage to write. I don't know whether I would be able to write what I'm writing without them. Joe, you're a great writer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we all are. Yeah. We have a question. Speaking of memoirs, um, what about your, you left off with the Turkish love. Right? Oh. <laughs> The question is, my, my third memoir uh, is, is, uh, ends when I'm 28 years old and I'm on a plane to Puerto Rico not feeling very thrilled about the prospect of what's going to happen at the other end. Um, and I, um, I keep thinking that I will do a sequel, um, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, because you know, once um, once I had that, exp I went to Puerto Rico and I spent the summer and was very, very. It actually changed the rest of my life. What happened there, uh, in terms of the kinds of people I met and the the response to Puerto Ricans to a Harvard graduate woman dressing like she lived in Boston and not like a Puerto Rican woman uh, with her, you know, anyway. So there was, I was, it was very, very dramatic for me. Um, and a few months after that, I met Frank Cantor, to whom I've been married now 45 years. And, um, and, and, um, and so my life changed so completely. Um, and I just, have not had it. I just haven't had any desire to write about about that. I, I considered. I have considered writing what happened that summer, because nobody was there <laughs> except me and my family. Um, and um, but I just haven't. I I can't get inspired to do that. Um, so I have. Um, I, I put in little hints in my other books, you know, of what kinds of things. And then of course, in my, when I do presentations, I talk about what happened. Um, but um, for some reason, it doesn't feel. It's not right just yet. So I might go home tonight and you know write 100 <laughs> pages overnight. So who knows? How do you begin to write, and how do you start a writer's group? Um, so I think we all probably um, believe that to be a writer, you have to be a reader. And you have to be a reader who reads challenging books. And, um, and you don't just read them, you study them. And you take notes, and you make sure that you understand what uh, these writers are trying to do. I also believe that if the book is junk, don't bother. Go to something else that you enjoy and that that helps you and that teaches you. But reading is so important because you are the first editor of your own work. And if you don't have that background, uh, uh, you know that literacy uh, as a reader, you will not do a good job editing your own work, and you won't know 
um, you know, you won't know a lot of things, <laughs> basically. Um, and then how do you start a, a book group? I have actually, I've always had book groups. I remember the first, when I first moved to, um, to the Katona area, I just put a little flyer in the, <laughs> in the Baker's Cafe, the long lamented <laughs> Baker's Cafe, and said any writers were interested in, in put together a, a writing group to share our work with one another and to get feedback. And so I think the original group was around eight, um, seven women and one man. And so we would meet uh, at each other's homes and, um, and basically did what we do. Um, and then it turns out that um, the gentleman <laughs> who joined us was so competitive um, with us that we asked him to uh, maybe find another group. <laughs> um, and so, so then it became just a women's group. And then when, we, when, I, went, when I wanted to do this, you know, once um, um, we weren't able, Marilyn and I weren't able to meet, um, our group in person couldn't meet because of the pandemic. Uh, and so I just reached out to people that I knew that are writers who I trust and respect. And so that's, that's how this group came, came together. But you can start with total strangers who are looking for the same kind of help that you, that you want. Ask at the library. Ask at the library. Put a sign up at the library. That's a really good sign. Fantastic. I just want to second what Esmeralda said about reading. Read good writers. Bad writing is contagious, but so <laughs> is good writing. And if you re read, I find that while I'm reading, if I'm stuck and I have this thing and I, I sometimes I have chapters that I just think, I don't know how to fix this. I know it's not working. Yeah, it makes me sick. And I start to read, sometimes I'll read Middlemarch. Sometimes I read the same book over and over. Mm -hmm. But I read something that's really good. I get the answer. Yeah. I get the answer from that book. And the way I read, because I'm a writer and an editor, as I think, oh, look what she did. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> Uh, oh, she got away with that? I'm going to try it. So I learned how to write by reading and reading and reading since I was a little, since I was old enough to hold a book and reading stuff that was way over my head probably, but I only read really good stuff. Stephen King says you have to spend the same amount of time reading as you spend writing and that there are no shortcuts. And one of the things that I used to feel guilty about was before I started writing for the day, I would read. And sometimes I would read for uh, like an hour or more. And then I would get inspired to write. And so I used to feel guilty about that. And then I read a memoir by Gord Vidal called Palpamcest. And he admitted to reading for three hours before he started writing. <laughs> so I'm now forgiven. <laughs> there was a question. There was a question over here. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you, many of you have been writing long enough to have been through the highly edited to the non-edited period. How, how does being in your group fill that gap, or does it? Well, I think it does, but I mean, we have Marilyn and Kathy and Joey were editors of publications, a, a, a variety of publications. And in that world also, it has changed a lot, of yeah. course. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Yes. Yeah, I thought you just figured your voice carry. I know. I was just like, you know, I'm the oldest of eleven children. I can everybody can hear me. Um, so yes, it's very. Um, it it has changed a lot. It has changed a lot because you don't really. You, you have a real. I had a relationship. My two editors for 30 years. One of them I knew I would lose eventually because she was in her 90s by the time she left us. Uh, the other one was much younger than I was, but she decided, she decided to resign, um, actually at a time when we were not agreeing on the way that she was um, critiquing my work. Um, but, but finding somebody to, to, to take you on, um, it so much depends on nothing to do with you. 
uh, I happened to have a fantastic agent who, when she realized that I was not getting along with my 25-year <laughs> relationship with my editor, um, and so she decided we're gonna find somebody else. And this person is younger than my son. <laughs> so so I, my first thought is, you know, is, does she even understand you know, what it's like to be old, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so I had to really, it, it, it becomes a process of, of uh, talking to them a lot, listen, listening to them, how they respond to your writing, and, uh, and then ultimately you just take this big leap. Um, and you don't know whether, whether, you know, as far as I know, my editor read my book. <laughs> She, she's never said she didn't, you know, but, but, but I don't know. I mean, I can't know. And I know that many people, you know, so many people have to read it in order to do their jobs. You know, the marketing people have to read it because they're looking for little bites that they can put in the media, for example, things like that. So, so there's this whole other process that is completely mysterious to me. And maybe the editors here can tell us yeah, a little bit I, about it. I mean, I can say that... Um, now that the um, editors, the acquiring editors, are so overworked that they really don't have time to do a good line edit. They don't have time. They don't do it. I know they don't. I get comments like, oh, could you just add a preface? I mean, nobody's line editing my work, and I know it. And what me that means is when they're looking to buy a book, they're looking for a book that they don't have to do any work on because they know they can't. So if you have a book that's a rough diamond, it's going to be hard to sell it because they don't have time to polish it. And that's why I make a living, because my writers are hiring me to edit their work before they even write the query letter, mm. because they know that they're not going to get a line edit from the big publishing houses or even the small ones. But we read each other's books in various stages. Yes. So, you know, when you have first proofs, I mean, you know, somebody in the group will raise a hand and offer to read it, not just for line editing suggestions or bad edits, but also for typos, mm -hmm. uh, because the copy editors are really yeah. overworked. I read books that should be perfect. And they're, I mean, even I have books that have been published by major publishers that have typos in them, you know, to this day. And I know they were read three times, yeah. so. Any other questions? Yes. Just repeat the question. Okay. Oh, just how do you how do you get it? How do you get the work done? When how do, don't you need a lot of discipline? Well, self discipline. Um, and I said up there that the writing group doesn't shame me, but I shame myself. I think I can't. You know, I have to do so. I have to try. You know, I have to at least be able to come in and say, look, I tried to do something, and and sometimes that just won't work. So I come in with something completely different, something, you know, crazy. I, you know, I, I came in one, a couple of weeks ago with a little piece about a parrot in the Garden of Eden. What? You know, <laughs> <laughs> three pages, but you know, it was something. I was able to do something. So it does, it does push you along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we get through. It helps if you think you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> Marilyn. It helps. It, uh, well, I would like to say that at the beginning of the pandemic, I had COVID when we didn't know much about COVID. And I was convinced that I was going to be carried out in a stretcher. So I went through all my notes and, you know, and said, oh, no, you didn't do this. You didn't get this done. Here's this thing that's half done. And I've been writing as if somebody's going to, you know, put the cane around my neck and yank me out at any time. And I, I think older uh, writers really do uh, feel um, 
that burning desire, that discipline, if you want to call it that. It doesn't feel like discipline. It feels like, help, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to watch Jeopardy. I have to like get this thought down. And so I think both um, Joey and I ha have been artists, uh, performing artists, and, and you learn a certain, a lot of yeah. discipline yeah. in those, you know, when you, when you do dance or when you do opera, you know, you're, you're from a very early age, you are, you're taught how important it is. And, um, and I think so for me, I went from being an Indian classical dancer to being a filmmaker to then being a, um, a writer, full-time writer. But I think a lot of the lessons that I learned in, you know, one of the things, of course, uh, that, that makes it easy for me um, is that, um, that it's all practice. That's you it. know, if you practice and you keep practicing and you keep practicing, something good is going to come out, whether well, yeah. it's you're singing arias or writing a poem or whatever. It's just practice is so necessary. And so from, for me, from all those years of doing the same choreography a thousand times by myself and in front of my cohort or my teachers or whatever, you, you, you realize that, that all all of art is practice. Yeah. And if you get into that place where you believe you're practicing, first you don't have the weight of, I am going to write the Nobel novel of the year, right? You're no, just it's, practicing. It's just what you do every day. I mean, I believe you have to read every day and you have to write every day. And that it's like playing the piano, because that's how I grew up, that was my discipline. I had to vocalize every day. And so um, I think I'm getting better, even though I'm old, because I'm still writing every day. I think I write better now than I did for my last book, yeah. or the book before that. Because I'm, it's like, you know, that somebody said to um, pa Pablo Casals, the great cellist, and he was in his 90s, and he was still practicing every day. And somebody said, but Maestro, why are you still practicing? And he said, I think I'm making progress. <laughs> I just wanted to add to your comment, Joey, about it being a practice, that you're gonna get better if you keep writing. But I think what holds a lot of us back even those of us who have had books published, is um, fear, fear of making a mistake or having it not great. And that's one of the reasons why writers always talk about shitty first drafts. And yes, shitty is the word that they use. And it's, I think that it's, um, you have to feel as though it's, it's really okay to make mistakes. Yeah. It's not gonna be great. Um, It'll get better. That's a more positive way to say it. It will get better. And um, I think to remember that, you know, you are the first person to, to, to see your writing, right? And, um, and then if you think that it doesn't look very good today, put it away and then looking, look at it on Thursday or Friday or whatever. Because sometimes um, we also can be our worst enemies when it comes to, to, to judging our own work. Um, it, it's, two, it's really two different sides. You know, they're the creator who can just go crazy and do anything. And then the other part is the crafts. Uh, and the craft, you can't, you can't fool the craft. You can, <laughs> you can fool the creativity, but you can't fool the craft because there are rules that are set up for whatever the craft is. And so I think that just to, to not feeling uh, that you have to be perfect each time, that you do create terrible drafts, and that you prepare yourself to be an editor by reading a lot of, a lot of books in the genre that you want to write, you know. Can I also add, there um, three of us are local writers, and this library and all the other libraries in this system really cater to people who want to write. Uh, they're very responsive. There are writers' centers all over the place, including one in Sleepy Hollow, uh, that furnish classes and introductory things and have uh, a concept called open write. 
and you can do it via Zoom, and there are two people who say, okay, let's, here's a prompt. Let's take 10 or 15 minutes and write. And that's a really fun way to get going into it. Um, but I would like to turn this back, uh, and maybe you guys would be happy to talk afterwards with anybody who's interested. Um, I would like to say thank you so much for helping celebrate these new novels, Las Madres and Anything But Yes. They are both ideal book club books, uh, as I know that some of you have already found. And we have a very special home here in the Chappaqua Library. And Joan, you've been fantastic. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Speaking for the staff of the Chappaqua Library, we love our authors. <laughs> we just love these women. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was, it was absolutely more than a writer's club, ladies. This is, um, this is everything. This is something I think we all dream of being part of. I know I do. You, you just want to have a group that's there to support you all the time, no matter what it is. And it certainly sounds to me like this is what you ladies do. So you're a wonderful group. And uh, thank you all for coming, and thank our wonderful authors. Thank you.